Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight. This is theCUBE where we go out to the events, extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, and my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Chris Poland, research strategist at IBM X-Force. Welcome to theCUBE. Oh, thank you, it's a pleasure so, to be here. Um, you guys have a security group. Um, obviously, this is not a security conference. IBM Insight's all about big data, big data analytics, and some of the you know, software behind it, but you know, soft security's the killer app right now for big data because of a lot of the pattern recognition things that go on with security breaches, right. and the fact that no one knows how they're being hacked, or if they're being hacked, uh, and if they were hacked, they don't know how they got hacked, so this creates a massive opportunity for data scientists and businesses to really use some of the latest technologies. So give us an update on, on what you guys are doing at X-Force and some of the things that you're doing around security with big data. Sure, actually, so one of the things we do at X-Force is we try to gather data from just about everywhere. So we're doing things like um, uh, crawling websites, looking for websites that have malicious software on it. Um, we're gathering spam and looking for phishing emails, finding out what the links are in those emails. Um, we're also collaborating with third parties and pulling in their data. Um, so effectively, we just amass a whole bunch of data and then we're trying to figure out who the bad guys are, what their tactics are, and then we put them in our products and we also provide them to customers and we educate customers as a result of it. You know, the reality is that what we're trying to do is to get ahead of the hackers, right? So it turns out for the last 10 years, 15 years, we've been playing defense pretty much predominantly. So if you think about football, for example, the best you can ever have is a draw if you stay on your side of the field. Um, and so, what we're tr and we can't really go to their side of the field, you know, unless you're law enforcement. But the goal is to try to at least get enough intelligence so that we're armed before they actually invade our side of the field, and that we're all prepared for it. And you're putting, it's like Bill Belichick when he had Spygate with the Jets, you know, so we, put, we love football analogies, by the way, so feel free and, and to And I'm from New England, by the way, so, so you're hitting me right where I live. So Doesn't does defense win championships, though? Well, uh, well, it does, but if you, the best is a draw, though, right? If your defense sucks, Dave, you're going to you know, have a bad secondary. Best defense is a good offense. So, so let, let's bromide. talk about some of, the, some of the things out there around this, because, you know, it is one of those things where, you know, the security paradigms are changing with multi-cloud, multi, uh, and now with, with apps out there, API economy, you have you know, so many holes and, and, and that kills this notion of perimeters, right. perimeter-based security. So it's a perimeterless IT environment and, and how does that impact what you guys see? And do you agree that we're moving to a perimeter's IT and what are some of the things that be prescribed for customers? Absolutely, you know, so if you think about things like mobile and cloud and now internet of things, right? So that's one of the things that we're trying to uh, get our hands around. Effectively, the perimeter is now the data. It's no longer about the, the perimeter itself. Even things like segmenting um, different parts of your network are somewhat effective, but they're not perfectly effective because you still need to be able to control the data, um, assess the data, I mean, where does it come from, who owns it, what value does it have? And organizations aren't doing a very good job of that in the first place, so we have two, two problems. One is that there's a perimeter, this perimeter legacy, and the second one is that we've got this data future, and unless we actually understand what the data is, there's no real way to, to protect it because we don't know who owns it, where it's going, who's supposed to have access to it. Um, you know, it's the whole uh, notion of, if you put something on the internet, it's gone forever. It can be copied as many times as you want. So how do we solve that problem? So that's part of the, the issue that we're dealing with, but um, so how do you protect the data, but how do you also figure out who's actually trying to steal the data itself? So, so much of information security, it seems, is shifting. And I wonder if you could just comment on this from sort of inside out to outside in. Um, I mean, when I think about identity management payments, authentication, digital trust, um, right. and, and as well, we seem to be sharing a lot more across society. Right. Whether it's firewalls, identity, you know, payments, on and on and on. So how is the security industry, first of all, is that valid? And how is the security industry generally adjusting to that in IBM specifically? <laughs> well, so it's interesting because with all new technology, security tends to be a bolt-on at, at the end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what businesses are trying to do, they want to, they adopt technology because it's either going to increase revenue or reduce cost. I mean, that is the fundamental business model. 
And then after the fact, they start worrying about what security needs to be wrapped around it. So what we're trying to do is get ahead of this bolt on after the fact and be part of the, the conversation up front. Um, and that's, a lot of times we talk about things like DevOps, um, which effectively is the way that you can uh, integrate development and operations so that the two go hand in hand and it sort of becomes, instead of development handing off to operations, and then operations having to figure out how to secure the data, you impose security at the development stage of things. So that's number one. And number two is that um, all these new technologies, Internet of Things, mobile, cloud, are creating huge amounts of data, as we all know. All of that stuff um, is, is an overpowering, a crushing amount of data, and it can be used against the users, right? So there's a privacy concern. If I can steal data from your phone, or if in the connected car um, I can steal information about your habits, um, I can do bad things to you. I can invade your home, I can steal the data from your phone through your car, or whatever it is. But the flip side of that is all this extra data, or all this, this weight of data, can also be used to do analysis and find out um, what kind of security can we impose on this stuff? So, who's actually accessing the mobile phone? Um, what kind of, uh, how is it phoning home to different places? What are the apps actually doing from a behavioral perspective? So now we can take that stuff, profile it, and say, what's normal behavior, and then look for anomalous behavior. And that's effectively what security does. It looks for anomalies uh, among the data that's supposed to be valid. So, values fit. so how do you do that? that so you're, you're sort of trolling through just petabytes of log data, and you've got systems to do this? Is, 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 are you applying Watson to this problem? Can you describe in more detail? Well, it's really interesting, because IBM is a big data company, fundamentally. When I came here three years ago from QN Labs, I thought the opportunity was, we have huge analytics capabilities, and that's beautiful for security. Um, it turns out that a lot of what we do, the security organization, is just like normal products, where it feels like a bolt-on to a lot of things. So now we're finally integrating with things like I2, um, with SPSS, big insights, and using that to pour through the data. Uh, and so we actually have this um, initiative going on now with uh, QN Labs, which is our SIM, our big data security analytics platform, that we're integrating with uh, big insights. So now we can take all that data, we collect it from all the instruments in the organization, so the firewalls, the intrusion prevention systems, antivirus, uh, network behavior anomaly, and we put it in the hands of the data scientists and let them create queries, ad hoc queries, and try to find interesting things. So that's where we are effectively in the security model right now is what kind of data do we have, what can we look for, what becomes an interesting um, analytics capability. And then we can feed that into the other things like SPSS, because now that we know what we're looking for, we can do predictive modeling and then feed it back into our, our analytic solutions like QRadar, which now we're going to look for those same things. So it's a big circle. It's gathering the data, putting it to the data scientist, visualizing it, uh, feeding it into predictive modeling, and then updating the uh, rules, the analytic rules at the security side. Mm -hmm. Have you seen um, some customers doing some things that you could share with the folks out there? And you don't have to go specific in some, some sensitive areas to start protecting, because we quoted the FBI director, said there's two types of companies. Those that have been hacked by China <laughs> and those who have been hacked by China that don't know they've been hacked by China. So, so this is a huge cyber security threat, certainly in America, for companies, but also, you know, there's really real sense of information being breached and incidents are increasing all over the place. And if you can, describe the difference between an incident and a breach. Well, that's <laughs> actually, that, that is a phenomenal insight, actually, because I was just going to say, when I hear hyperbole, like you know, the FBI saying there's two types of people, you know, effectively, yeah. it's good for it's good. We're meeting, we love the drama. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, yeah, it's yeah, better yeah. sales for us. But but there's a nuance there, right? Well, and I think you hit it right. So there's an yeah. incident and versus a breach, right? And so, yes, everybody has some malware in their organization. Everybody's been breached to some extent. But the question is, how severe is it, and what's the consequence, right? So are we stealing really important state secrets or the intellectual property that's going to um, force your business out of business, uh, or is it just some nuisance malware that's in there trying to steal credentials and um, effectively what they're really going to do with that is go and uh, hijack the bank accounts of your employees and not actually affect your business. So there's all these degrees, and the unfortunate part of security right now is that we are treating all breaches as, as, as if they're, um, as if they're Equivalent impact. Right, and, yeah. and we all see you don't know. They could be looking for credentials to backdoor in from a air conditioning HVAC system. Right, well actually that's a brilliant uh, point because there is no direct evidence that that was how that particular attack occurred, by the way. So <laughs> there's, that's an inference and we love yes. it because we're media companies, right? But Well this is where big data could provide value, right? Exactly. So 
the thing that we get concerned about is, and we, we track um, breaches across uh, different years, so we actually have a nice little bubble chart, I wish I had it with me right now, and you can see the breaches growing, but one of the things that concerns me is when you look at how the breaches occurred, a lot of those bubbles are gray, which is they haven't been disclosed. How did the company get compromised in the first place? And the thing that, that means one of two things. It either means that the company knows about it and they just don't want to disclose it, which is not really bright, because we know from past history that in order to retain customer loyalty, which is really what you care about, um, you would disclose it and you would say, you know, mea culpa, we know how they got in, we put these remedial efforts in place. But my suspicion, um, based upon you know, empirical evidence, is that they just don't know. They don't, they've got the instrumentation in some cases, but they don't actually know how to go through and do the analytics. So the problem is you get hacked, you don't know how you got hacked into, you buy some more technology, and then you just hope that they don't hack in again. This is where, and he and I were just talking about Dave on the last segment is that you got context, which is the context right. computing you know, marketing that IBM puts out there, which is you, know, you set the table, you get the data, multiple entities, and then the cognitive piece is what you're just referring to, which is the human aspect. Right. What's the decision? How do I act on it? What is it? How do I approach it? Is that kind of what you're referring to? Exactly, if you can't do root cause analysis, how are you going to stop it from reoccurring? I mean, that's effectively, Number one, number two is PR. So for every incident, you have to have a plan that's not just recovering the data or figuring out what the impact is, it's how do you have, how do you respond from a marketing perspective, retain your customer loyalty, because from a business perspective, that's the most important thing. Um, and so if you don't have the analytics capability, and most customers actually instrument their environments to collect the data, they just don't know how to analyze it and make important decisions with it. So, so let's talk about the kind of attacks that are out there. Because it's kind of the fun side. Well, fun, not fun. But I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it, think it game is the movie. It is the movie. I mean, plot, it is though. Right? I, mean, I mean, you guys are probably all gamers, right? I mean, gamers <laughs> love to shoot things down. First-person shooter. But we uh, let's talk about the kinds of attacks. You got to throw the malware in there, or try to sneak in and kind of be quiet. And then there's the active penetration of, 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 of brute force attacks, whether it's DDoS or whatever, right? Right. Um, so I got to ask you about the pattern recognition and the personalities behind the attackers. Right. So talk about the nuance, because we've talked to other security experts here on theCUBE, and they love to talk about, we can recognize that guy, or right. we know that pattern, here he comes again. Yeah. So pattern recognition is really uh, effective with machine learning and some of these tools you've been mentioning. So yeah. talk about some of that stuff around patterns, personalities, and, and whatnot. Well, so the, and it, that, I think you hit the nail on the head there, right? So one of the things that we try to do is attribution and figure out who it is that's attacking you for a number of reasons. You know, you can go to law enforcement, number one. Um, it tends to be an inter, uh, inter country problem, right? So it's not necessarily, we can't necessarily take our FBI and go um, arrest some guy in Ukraine, but we can work with Europol and things like that. You probably won't recover we'll the- Go black ops and take them out that way. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there may be those folks out there. I'm not saying there are, but <laughs> it certainly isn't with us. But, um, so you can, you know, figuring out who that person is, not necessarily because you can recover your financial losses, but because now they can start watching this person and profile them. And so, but the hard part about attribution is, usually what the bad guys do is they'll take over some university uh, computer and they'll launch their attacks from there and maybe multiple uh, hops between us and the attacker. So the only way that you can really go back, because what you can't do is say, look, I got attacked and I'm going to go attack the university that attacked me, get a point of presence there and sort of follow the trail back, is you look at what software they put on your systems in order to compromise it in the first place. You know, so we're seeing a lot of point of sales, uh, RAM scrapers, for example, and we know that certain factions use something called black paws, other ones use um, another variant of that. Um, they may break in through uh, third parties, you know, as you pointed out, HVAC contractor. Um, they might do that through phishing schemes and use uh, particular types of malware that are delivered through the phishing emails. And so when we, when we can profile them that way and look at their MO, now we can go back and say the attribution is definitely some cyber crime organization out of the Ukraine or maybe it's uh, um, a nation state action from you know, wherever, let's not implicate anybody in particular. And now we can actually start to determine who it is that's attacking us. We know where to close it off, we know where to look um, when we're looking for impact, um, those kind of things. So it turns out we can't actually attack them back, but we can actually uh, work with law enforcement and close off our own vulnerabilities. Well, I, I feel like, I wonder if you could comment on this, speaking of you know, media sensations, but I feel like Stuxnet was mm. sort of a, a, a <laughs> hot, new high water mark or low water mark in the security world. I mean, you had the smartest guys in the world <laughs> figuring out how to you know, perpetrate that, that attack, and right. it just seemed to open Pandora's gate. Is that a, a fair ass assessment? To, was Stuxnet, Stuxnet sort of a new, era that set off a renaissance in, 
insecurity, good or, or bad? Well, I, I think it's a lot like what we're seeing with, uh, with governments um, looking at our, at our communications, right? It's something that's been going on for a long time, but that was just the one, uh, that one incident that made the public aware. You know, and eventually, of course, uh, the president came out and said, look, we're behind it. Um, so it, it gave us a glimpse behind a door that not many people have a view behind. And frankly, I came from, I used to work for the NRO a long time ago, so um, I got a view into a lot of this stuff. And I will tell you that what we see in the public eye, a lot of stuff that comes through the media, has been going on for a long time. Right, and the it's way old that news for, to the guys who are inside and know. Right, but <laughs> and when they message it out to the public, they actually spin it in a construct that's not actually uh, it's not the truth of the matter behind the scenes. So it is a little bit of a facade anyway. So whenever I see things like Stuxnet, I really wonder what happened, you know, because it is the public view of what, of what the government wants us to know and what the real motivation behind it was. Well, in, 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 uh, but as well, the technology breakthroughs that w were, w were made, is that? I don't know that it's really a technology breakthrough as it was somebody coming up with a really creative idea. Uh-huh, okay. Um, because if you think about it, this is the great thing about security. Being a hacker is really fun. <laughs> and I've done uh, black hat penetration testing at one point in my life. It, well, you mentioned games, actually. <laughs> I'm no longer a gamer, I'm 50 now, so I've- But you were a gamer, time. for the at record. One, <laughs> at one point, all the best <laughs> email spammers were gamers, and the best security guys are all gamers, because <laughs> it's like, true. come on, it's Call of Duty right there, come on. <laughs> That's right, although my games are a lot, a lot older <laughs> than Call of Duty. But the, uh, so the fun part about security is trying to figure out how to break in. If you're not thinking about these movie plot ideas, how would I break into XYZ Corporation? And then start poking around a little bit and see what they have. You know, you can go on social media and do some, some big data mining on your own, what we call um, uh, open source intelligence gathering. Um, and sort of figure out what their profile is and try to come up with these movie plot ideas to break in. Then you simplify it a little bit because movie plots tend to be overly complicated. And then you start looking at what uh, well-funded cybercrime organizations, uh, nation states do, and that's where Stuxnet comes in. Right. And if you think about what they did is they created a piece of malware that they were able to install in a nuclear, um, in a facility that was enriching uranium, and they managed to overtake their SCADA system send back uh, messages back to the control operator saying everything's, everything's fine. Everything's good, right. While they <laughs> spun the uh, centrifuge out of control. And if that's just like the movie plots where somebody comes up to the camera that's pointing down the hallway and manages to put up some film that makes the hallway look normal while they're walking down the hallway. You know what I mean? Right, so it's a, but it was a function of creativity and, and coordination to actually make that happen, not necessarily technology breakthrough. Right. I also wanted to ask your opinion on, because I always feel like privacy is the flip side of security, and the other media sensation, of course, is Snowden. A lot of customers certainly talk about it. When you really probe, um, well, it depends. I guess in Europe, maybe there's a little bit greater sensitivity, yeah. but I wonder if you could address that. Do you get the, that question a lot from, from customers? Um, what happens when the U.S. government wants to access um, my data? What does IBM do? Do you tell me to encrypt? Um, will you fight? Um, what's the, <laughs> what do you do there? You know, I, we don't get it a lot from organizations, from enterprises. Mm -hmm. You know, we get it from individuals because it turns out that individuals are largely concerned about their own privacy. And in fact, little confession, even though I don't game, I actually bought Google Glass, you know, about a year ago. And it's kind of an interesting social experiment to wear that around. Uh, most organizations aren't overly concerned. You know, I, I wouldn't wear it through a casino here in Vegas, just because it seems like somebody would be, get a little upset what stays in Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens in Vegas? They might break your arm. Too. Right. <laughs> but when you walk up to individuals, the first thing they say is, is that thing recording? And so it's kind of interesting. And so when you turn it around and you start talking to individuals, they're the ones who are concerned about their email um, being monitored, uh, about somebody, I can't remember what that movie was about four or five years ago with Will Smith where you could see everything for, through every camera on the planet. You know, if you're in a retail store, the NSA had access to that and they could follow you right, around. Right. Uh, uh, enemy of the state, that's what it was. But that's not the reality of what happens now. If it is, then that would be the real technology sophistication. Um, but so from a privacy perspective, what we really hear it from is things like uh, hospitals who have HIPAA concerns, so they are trying to, they're trying to protect the individual's privacy and not necessarily the privacy of the organization. Um, and the ways that that, are hap the ways that, that works is through encryption. Um, it, pretty much encryption, because nobody's going to give up technology because the functionality is so great. So, in other words, I think 
maybe in three or four years, Google Glass will be, everybody's going to have something like Google Glass. It may not be Google Glass, because it's a bizarre looking piece of equipment. But, <laughs> but when they find out what the killer app is, everybody's going to want it, and then all of a sudden your privacy concerns are going to go away. So if I encrypt my data and take care of my keys, and the US government goes to IBM and says I want Dave's data, okay, fine, if, if you had to give it to them, I'm, I'm, I'm covered. Would you fight them? Or would you put up a barrier? Would you say, well, why do you want Dave's data? Or would you say, here's Dave's data? Huh? What's right. IBM's posture toward that? Well, you know, I don't know what IBM's posture is, but I'll tell you what, my, my view on that is that pers your personal data, you can't treat it as if everything is equal. So it's back to that whole yeah, problem. Yeah, the whole threat. My, my email profile. might contain my grandmother's chocolate chip cookie recipe, which is fine. If the NSA wants that, they can have it. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe not, uh, maybe not Nabisco, because I <laughs> want to keep that, that's my hair <laughs> But, you know, at the same time, if I'm doing something illicit, then that might be where I'm worried about privacy. Uh, so I think we really have to make a decision about what, where we fight for our privacy rights. At the same time, we just can't give them all up, because it's, you know, they came from my neighbor, they came, you know, eventually they came from me type of thing. Um, so the reality is, I think we're at that, that inflection point right now where we're really worried about privacy. Uh, we see government as big brother but we really need to make some smart decisions and I don't think that conversation is happening because the general public doesn't think of it in those terms in terms of risk management. They just think of it as an all or nothing problem. So companies like IBM talk about the hybrid cloud. Um, uh, one of the obvious things to check here is security. So is my security on premises sort of the same model, the same framework, the same edicts when I go into the IBM public cloud, or whatever you're calling it, the hybrid cloud, the off-premises off right. cloud. Well, and that's a different story, because as IBM, we have to, we have to protect the customer's data, uh, absolutely. So we can't, we as IBM don't know that I'm storing my grandmother's chocolate chip cookie recipe, or if I'm storing uh, HIPAA privacy data. Right. Right. And so we have to protect that data as if it's uh, the utmost that needs the utmost protection to it. So that's the problem with being a service provider is that mm -hmm. we don't have that context. Right. So, th and I think that's the difference between enterprises and individuals, and individuals can make that decision, or at least customers of enterprises. So our customers may know what data they're putting in there. So it could be a HIPAA workload, it could be um, whatever, it could be anything. And they're the ones who have to decide where they put their data and what and where they don't put their data, right? So sometimes you may not want to put your data into a public cloud, regardless. But we as IBM have to assume that it's all completely sensitive data and that mm. we protected that. Chris, way. thanks for coming on. We've got a break here, but I want to give you the final word. Share with the folks out there, just summarize uh, you know, the special forces. You guys have um, this special group, right? So X-Force. So yeah. X -Force. Um, talk about the group and just what do they need to know about security in general? Just summarize the, the whole mission into a quick soundbite. So, from, from what we do at the X-Force, our entire goal is to make sure that there is never a patient zero. Um, we want to be able to uh, do analysis, collect the data, do analysis on it, and arm our customers before, there's actually, before the bad guys actually attack them. And so, we're working towards that goal. Security isn't there yet in general. Um, but as IBM, we have the best tools to do this. I think I mentioned that before. And we're confident that we're going to get there and, and just defeat the bad guys on the defensive side. Yeah, and, and certainly Steve Mills was talking about, it's no secret, the huge R&D budget IBM has and access to massive amounts of computing and database stuff. Special Forces, X-Force there uh, in IBM, really protecting the customers. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great conversation. Again, security's hot. Security will be really, really a big focus for big data, getting the insights, actionable insights, understanding how to understand root causes and really protecting us. Congratulations, great work. Love to have you on, thanks for all your time. This is theCUBE, we're here live extracting the data, sharing that with you here in Las Vegas at IBM Insight. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>